today, you know, for a change. I'm also on, on, on the road. Uh, also kind of for a change. But I do have an important one, and uh, it also for a change today. And uh, not... Not the indictment, which is very important, but I, I, I knew that was going to happen because uh, Trump told us it was going to happen, uh, I think. You know, whatever he does confuses me. But I knew he'd be indicted. Uh, if not for this, which he definitely should have been indicted for, uh, if he hadn't bribed Stormy Daniels uh, right after the Access Hollywood video, uh, he would have lost. Also, it's illegal. Uh, to bribe someone with an unreported campaign contribution. But um, there's going to be three or four more indictments. If you're a frequent listener to the podcast, you've heard me reference Trump's comment from his uh, first campaign. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and wouldn't lose a vote. And maybe he was right. He might not have lost a vote, but he would have been indicted. And You're also uh, going to get indicted if you lie to the Georgia Secretary of State and say you won his state by over 400,000 votes and that all you need for him is to find 4,780 votes and that if he doesn't, he and his lawyer would be in big trouble. So that's in Georgia. That's, That's another one. And that's also a federal charge. That's three. And how about the top secret documents he took and kept lying about? That's another one or two. And then, of course, uh, there's a little matter of seditious conspiracy, which I believe he's guilty of. So we're going to see indictments, and uh, we'll be talking about uh, those uh, ad infinitum. Well, God knows for how long. And that will be fun, I guess. Today, I wanted to focus on Israel. My guest is Aaron David Miller. Uh, He is currently senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, He's been the go-to guy on Israel for decades for several administrations, both Democratic and Republican. Look, I'm a 71-year-old Jew. That's right, I said it. I was born in 1951, just six years after the end of um, World War II. America was very anti-Nazi at the time. If you were a Nazi in the 50s, you just kept that to yourself. Now, not so much. I uh, grew up in Minnesota in a uh, small town right next to Lake Wobegon. It was called uh, uh, Whitefish, uh, where all the women make great gefilte fish. All the men are pro-Israel, and all the kids get SAT prep. No, that's true. I I did that once on Prairie Home Companion, and Garrison actually didn't like it. But I I did grow up in a suburb of Minneapolis, uh, St. Louis Park. It was called St. Jewish Park because we were 20% Jewish. That part's true. In Minnesota, any Jews is a lot of Jews. In fact, uh, that was Minnesota's license plate uh, until 1957. That's not true. Anyway, American Jews loved Israel. Six million Jews had been exterminated by the Nazis in 1945. That's 60% of the world's Jews. And it made sense to a a lot of the world to make Israel our original home, Israel's homeland. And, of course, it wasn't a perfect solution because uh, the Palestinians happened uh, to live there too. So there's wars... um, some brokered peace. Uh, You'll remember Anwar Sadat of Egypt, uh, not Palestine, and uh, Menachem Begin uh, brokering a peace in 78. Of course, uh, Sadat got killed in 81. Later, uh, so did Israel Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in 95, making it harder uh, for Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat to finally uh, make peace with Clinton after uh, the Camp David Accords and over the years, there have been infatadas and violence on both sides, terrorist attacks from Hamas in Gaza, failed attempts uh, to work out stuff with the Palestinian Authority, which has been kind of corrupt, if I may say so, persecution of and violence against Palestinians, Jewish right wing religious settlers moving into Palestinian areas, uh, making a division into Two states, basically impossible. Sorry about my cold, by the way. 
I, of course, uh, was in the Senate for a number of years, and during that time, things seemed to get just worse and worse. And I have to say that uh, Netanyahu has been a malefactor in all of this. I remember in 2012, they had an APAC dinner in D.C. It seemed everybody in Congress went to that, uh, both sides. And I, I was at a front table, and Mitch McConnell stated something that I had never uh, heard before, which was, he, he was trying to drive a wedge between Democrats and Republicans on Israel. And I always thought that uh, one thing that made Israel stronger was that it was nonpartisan. And um, at this point, everything started deteriorating. One of the uh, selling points on Israel is that it is the sole democracy in the Middle East. But Netanyahu is is throwing that away. The radical conservatives in Israel that have formed a government with Netanyahu as prime minister is now leading Israel off a cliff. The United States has three branches of government, the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary. Israel just has a legislative, the Knesset, and um, like any parliamentarian government, no executive. The prime minister... Uh, Netanyahu is the head of the government, and he appoints the other ministers. So that leaves the judiciary, and Netanyahu wants the Knesset to have full power to hire and fire uh, new members of the Israeli Supreme Court, which makes it not independent. And Netanyahu is currently supposed to be on trial for corruption, and He has built this coalition in no small part so that he and his conservative allies in his coalition can pick the judges who will preside over Netanyahu's case or dismiss it. Sounds a little like us. Well, that's not a democracy, and uh, Israelis have been taking to the streets in huge numbers for quite a while now, and uh, that's what uh, Aaron and I uh, discussed on Wednesday. Now, a couple of other things. A, uh, <clears throat> a few times during the conversation, uh, you will hear Aaron's wife, uh, Lindsay, have a kind of a cough, a coughing, oops, a coughing fit. Um, I suggested at one point that she moved to another room, and that helped to some extent. Um, but I called Aaron back later, and Lindsay's fine. Uh, but you'll hear it a couple times, and it's something. So we have an interesting one in, in a number of ways uh, today, and uh, a good one as well. You know, for a change. So let me ask you about your name, uh, Aaron David Miller. Uh, Milstein? Was it a Milstein? Are you, where are you from? No, from Cleveland. Actually, Shaker Heights, Ohio. Okay, Shaker Heights, uh, that which, of course, anyone who plays Jewish geography knows that... Always, always do that, Al. It's a small, it's a small world. It is. And now, let me. So, let me ask you, Miller. Was that when you came uh, over through Ellis Island? Were you Miller, or you were did you... actually come through Ellis Island? It's a matter of debate. I think the name Miller originally from Kiev. I found out. Oh, good. Um, okay. Through research done by uh, a couple of my cousins, Miller is the sixth most common name in the United States. Actually. Okay. All right. Well then. My my family from uh, sort of the same area, well, one side anyway, and German on the other. So uh, as Jews, uh, of course, and about the same age, or a few a couple of years older than me, at least, uh, we care about Israel. We've cared about Israel since we were kids. You and I were both born in the wake uh, of the Holocaust, and uh, and Israel was kind of a huge inspirational victory. For Jews and a natural place to go, Palestinians may not have thought so, but something that the Jews my generation have been felt emotional uh, emotional tie to. Absolutely, but you know, Al, I worked for half a dozen secretaries of state on both sides, both the Republican and Democrat, R- R's and D's, and where I learned, by the way, the dividing line for an effective U.S. foreign policy isn't between left and right, liberals or conservative. A Republican or Democrat, it's, it's between dumb on one side and uh, smart on the other. And the only question 
for Americans is which side of the line you want to be on. I have some suggestions if you want to maximize the chances of being on the smart side. Okay. That's what, that's what my, my listeners want. Right. My point is that I, my identity, and I'm a proud member of the American Jewish community, some 5.8 million Jews, half of whom are, any, are, are not affiliated either with the synagogue or any Jewish organization. But uh, I'm, a, I'm a proud member of that community, but superseded by my love of the republic, my identity as an American. And during the years I was working- Of course, of course, of course. Working, um, my preeminent concern was the pursuit of American national interests. And frankly, during those 25 years, even though there were some periods of tension, particularly when I worked for Bush 41 and James Baker, there wasn't really a major conflict between the pursuit of American national interests, certainly in Israeli security. I mean, we argued with the Israelis a lot, like Biden right now, frankly, is uh, involved in a little TikTok with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. He's in a very different place than... Yes. Uh, Israel's in a very different place. because is. This is a crisis, you know, it's supposed to be a, a democracy. It's supposed to be a Jewish democracy. That's the whole point. Yep. And right now we're feeling like what Netanyahu is doing is ending that because if the Knesset is able to get rid of judges, you know, we, we have three branches of government in the United States. We have the Congress, the Supreme Court, the executive branch. Of course, the Knesset is the executive branch because the Knesset chooses the prime minister. Right. The, the executive and the legislative is basically merged. So Israel basically has two branches, right? The prime minister and the parliament, which is considered one branch, and the judiciary. And that's what all the fighting's about now, because Netanyahu wants to, and his coalition partners, want to undermine an independent judiciary. So A, he can beat his trial for ongoing ongoing trial. Now, three years in, Al, three years in, in a Jerusalem district court in front of three judges, judges, that's important. The ultra-religious want to uh, neuter the Supreme Court so they can pass a law which exempts their constituents from conscription, right. military service. Haven't and they then, been re- exempted before? Or th- This has been fought out, Al, since the, almost the inception of the state. The government basically created a draft law that would have exempted exempted these religious communities from military service. And the Supreme Court overturned that. Exactly. Therefore, you know, they want the court constrained. And the two ministers uh, in the extreme religious Zionist party want the court restrained so they can pass laws that bind the West Bank and parts of, well, Jerusalem is already annexed. That would bind most of the West Bank, the sixty percent that in which settlers reside, to Israel proper. So everybody has a stake in trying to pass this. It's really not judicial reform. It's it's a judi- it's a judicial coup, frankly. So it would take a a uh, two branch government, the court and the Knesset, which is the parliament, which selects the prime minister, and make it a one branch government, which would just be the Knesset, which chooses the prime minister. Well, it would. it's not going to abolish the courts. It'll just fundamentally restrict their right to overturn laws. And it would give to the government the edge in appointing judges, which is really, really important. It would and also give the Knesset the right to fire judges, right? Isn't that what's going on now? It accords to the Knesset extraordinary powers over the judiciary, but it's the selection of the jurists that really, I I think- So if you have that power, if the Knesset has that power and can at any time fire, this isn't like our Supreme Court where you pick someone, they're there. They can't be fired. This would be a very, very, very different. This is, to me, the Knesset uh, and uh, the prime minister control the Supreme Court in a way that makes it the Supreme Court powerless, essentially. Yeah, on, on major issues of importance to the government. Remember, you have 120 seats in the Knesset. All you really need for a majority is 61. Netanyahu has 64, so he has a comfortable margin. Right. Now, where, when did this happen in your, your judgment? Where we went from what I thought was going to be a two-state solution 
where you're going to have a Jewish state, a democracy called Israel, and you're going to have a Palestinian state, hopefully also a democracy, and they would live side by side in peace. That was for that was quite a vision, a Al. That was a vision. I I have to say, having been involved in these negotiations from the mid '80s until 2003, when I left the, the George W. Bush administration, that was a vision, Al. We've never ever, in the course of the last 25 years, ever come what you and I, normal humans, would consider literally being close to closing a deal that would allow the end state that you just outlined to become a reality. We've never been there. There's been aspirations. There have been hopes on certain issues. There's been some progress. I was at the last best chance, right, to do this. In July 2000, when then President Clinton brought Ehud Barak, then Prime Minister of Israel, and Yasser Arafat, chairman of the PLO, for 13 days in the Catoctin Mountains at Camp David in an effort to close a conflict ending agreement that would have produced precisely the outcome that you have identified. And that summit, in my judgment, ill-advised, ill-prepared, ill-conceived with the best of intentions. We all recommended to, this, to the president that he go, despite my personal misgivings that he could succeed. He wanted to do this before the end of his term. He loved Rabin. He writes in his memoirs that he loved Rabin as he had loved no man. And King Hussein died of cancer in 1999. So he had Rabin on one shoulder and King Hussein on the other, both whispering to him, you got to do this. You got to do this. You care about this. And Clinton tried. I'll give him that. But the gaps on the core issues, Al, Jerusalem, borders, security, refugees, and ultimately the end of conflict, the gaps on those issues in July 2000 were as wide as the Grand Canyon. And in September of that year, after the summit failed, the late Prime Minister Ariel Sharon decides that he's going to go visit the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif, the noble enclosure for the Muslims, the Temple Mount, the Har Habayit, right, where the remains of both of the Jewish temples reside. He went up there with hundreds of police and supporters. And Mr. Arafat, who felt he had been blamed for the collapse of the summit, decides he's going to loose the tiger, the Palestinian tiger of violence. And that tiger has never been put back into the cage. The Israeli-Palestinian relationship, Al, has not recovered 23 years later. So that's that's the moment. That that was the last, what I would call, you know. The last hope. The last best chance. But the gaps are too big, Al, the mistrust too profound, the politics on both sides, both sides, just not right. And right now, you know, right now it's a mess. My question is, what's well, everyone's question is what's Netanyahu going to do? Because again, this goes down to his the fact that he's indicted on what three counts or something? Yeah, and, uh, bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. Okay, hey, that sounds pretty serious. Yeah, um, and this has been going on for like three years. How does that happen? Well, the these. <laughs> The judicial system in Israel is in need of reform. I mean, th they haven't even begun to call, the prosecution defense hasn't even begun to call the numbers of witnesses after three years. Three years. Yep. Okay. Why? Why is that? That can't possibly I, you be. You know, I, I know what I don't know, even though I'm in a hurry to find out. I, I couldn't tell you why that trial has taken three years. It's the number of witnesses. It's the complexity of the charges in the case. It's the the timeouts and the breaks that the judges take. I think the judges actually are on a month sort of vacation now. Jesus. And, you know, there is precedent. Ehud Olmert, former prime minister of Israel, took six years, Al, to convict him. And he served 16 months in, in the can. So 
if this trial ever concludes and Netanyahu doesn't figure out a way to immunize himself and use his Knesset majority to get a get out of jail free card. And, and a lot of people think that that's yeah, what I, this is I all about. Be, and I would be one of those people who think that's part of the reason he's pressing for this. OK, so recently we've had these huge demonstrations. How big have they been? Where have they been? How long have people been there? Yeah, I'll have to tell you. I, I, I'm i 74, right? So Israel turned 75. I, I've been a part of, of studying this country for a long time. These are unprecedented. Unprecedented demonstrations in their scope, in their composition, in their intensity, in their objective. And I don't think, frankly, nine weeks of these, actually 13 weeks, this will be the 13th weekend of these protests. I'm not sure it's possible to put the genie back in the bottle. That is to say, once you put that many people who are, who are angry but largely peaceful, they're now going to emerge as a force that Israeli politicians, not just Netanyahu, but Israeli politicians are going to have to take into account. You know, I'm thinking about our situation here. We can indict. There are we some can parallels. Impeach, we can indict. We can impeach. We can investigate. But you know, you want to safeguard your democracy. Not only do you have to vote, you sometimes got to vote with your feet. Six percent of the po population of Israel showed up for one or more of these demonstrations. Can you imagine if you had six percent of three hundred and thirty million Americans out in the streets in any state peacefully? Out in the streets on any sustained basis, but That's, we're well, different countries. Thousand people. Yeah, it's Mars and Venus. Al. We're, di we're 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 different countries. We're they a had bigger a moment. country geographically too, but nevertheless, this is different. Now, who are these people? Are these people? Do they represent a majority of Israelis, or are we talking about the progressives who represent twenty percent, or thirty percent, or forty percent? Who are they? According to the polls, 60%, the majority support, and they come from all different sectors. You got high tech entrepreneurs who have turned Israel into a startup nation right. out there in the streets, worrying that Netanyahu is going to cause them to be a shutdown nation. You got military reservists. And remember, Israel has not fought, not the standing military. The Israeli military functions on the basis of its reserves particularly Air Force and intelligence. You've got hundreds, if not thousands, of military reservists failing to report to reserve duty, signing petitions saying that they will not serve an illegitimate government if these judicial reforms go through. This is unprecedented. The Israeli Defense Forces, still the most cherished and res most well-respected institution in the state, they've now opened up Netanyahu has opened up a real problem in terms of military readiness and social cohesion. You have religious Jews, some of whom are from settlements, showing up to support. And you've got a large group of secular Israelis representing various economic and social classes. I would largely argue it's the middle and upper middle class out there in the streets. What I kind of was asking was, is this group different electorally? Are, are they big enough? Are they sufficient to, in the next election, get rid of this guy? Well, the polls now suggest that Likud, which is the largest party in the coalition. That's his party, right? Netanyahu's party. Yeah. Largest in the coalition would suffer a significant defeat if elections were held today. Now, that's today. So, yes. But all these are coalition governments, so even if Likud suffered a big defeat, would he be, could he be at the top of a government? So we're, they're, they're not directly electing the prime minister. So in order to govern in Israel, and remember, Al, in, in the last election, there was a 30, only a 30,000 vote differential between the pro-Netanyahu bloc and the anti-Netanyahu bloc. But that's irrelevant because the Pro Netanyahu bloc has more common partners. It's a more homogenous coalition. It's the Likud plus the religious parties 
plus the religious Zionists. And the center left is much more a hodgepodge. So they were able to form a government, uh, the right, the right. So my question is, is this changing things? It could, but I think it, that's the headline now. We don't know what, we really don't know what the trend lines are. And, I, and how does an you, election get called? Who, who has to do that? The majority? Well, if the government collapses and the prime minister loses his majority, if that should happen, then you'd have an election probably within three months. The governments go to term in four years. The average length of an Israeli government since independence is 1.8 years. This government's been up and running for three three months. So I don't think it, it's going to collapse anytime soon. E- even with this in, this in the street? Now, you know politics. In Israel, you get a, a nice car, you get a big office, you get a budget. Once you're a minister, once the government's formed, there's really a lot of inertia behind this. They really don't want to give up their perks. And the religious parties, the ones who are getting tremendous subsidies for the support of their religious schools and the yeshivot, definitely don't want to leave the coalition. So I suspect this government may be around for a while. So you're saying that the people in the streets, that group isn't big enough to change the situation. Oh, no, I think it's big enough if they, if they could figure out a way to organize politically. But you'd need, again, you'd need an election for that, and you'd need a leader. You'd need an, an Israeli who could command the respect and the attention of this particular group of humans. Benny Gantz, a former minister of defense, who was prime minister as you know, in the last government, mm-hmm. um, his poll numbers have gone way, way up. He's been in the forefront of these demonstrators. And, you know, if elections were held today, I suspect Gantz would be able to form a government. So how does an election get called? you got to collapse this government. And in order to do that, out of the 64 seats, somebody's got to desert. You've got to lose and five. And, you know, it's like what it's what was like what Sam Adams, our own revolutionary founder, said we're in reference to the British, where they're going to hang together or hang separately. That's that's the mentality of the coalition right now. They're besieged. Netanyahu will do a lot. He'll pay a lot. And that's another problem in order to keep this coalition together. Well, when when did Israel move to the right? And was it as you're kind of suggesting, when uh, the Palestinians did not show good faith? You know, it's more complicated than that. It's of not course it is. <laughs> well, right. No, I mean, look, hey, Al, I'd like, you know, there's a compelling case. Look, I'll tell you how you can look at this. You can root for one side or the other, right? Mm-hmm. You can do that. I, I like to root for both sides. Right, exactly. And And the point is, this is a conflict in which two national movements, one has a state, one one is seeking to become a state, has a lot of legitimate needs and requirements which need to be reconciled. It's easy to cast this as a morality play, with the forces of goodness, depending on who you like, versus the forces of evil, badness, on the other hand. But that gets you nowhere. Well, that's, that's a morality play, but if you can't agree on who's good and who's bad, to what extent do very wealthy Arab countries, say uh, Saudi Arabia, to what extent have they played a negative role? I mean, couldn't they have been all these years helping uh, Palestinians prosper and uh, making this all more possible? Yeah, the Arab states exploited the Palestinians, not so much the Saudis, but the states that shared contiguous borders with Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt, all wanted to control the Palestinian issue. Except that those countries, especially Egypt and and Jordan, have come to peace agreements for quite some time now. Right. Jordan in 94 full treaty of peace, Egypt in 79, full treaty of peace, Syria, endless negotiations, no agreement, Lebanon, too weak, too much under the influence of Syria and now under Hezbollah, even though the, uh, interestingly enough, the Lebanese and the Israelis have concluded an intriguing gas sharing 
offshore gas sharing agreement. Um, and it's Bulla bought onto that. It's, it's largely because Lebanon. I think someone in your house is choking. Someone I'm in my house is choking. I hope not. But if she's choking, <laughs> she should probably go into another room. It would be interesting, though, on the Al Franken podcast to get someone choking to death in the background. <laughs> I, I, so. I had to tell Lindsay she's got to move. <laughs> okay, she's tell Lindsay. Cough. Yeah, she could go into the quiet room. So when the Palestinians invade your house, that's where she goes. <laughs> We've had all kinds of secret <laughs> negotiations here, Al. <laughs> okay. Seriously, okay. trust me. Okay, well, Lindsay, is Lindsay uh, in out of harm's way? or well, in, Lindsay is, is painting now in the kitchen. Oh, is that that kind of painting where you cough on the, uh, no. On the canvas? And no, it's watercoloring. Oh, and the, okay. And, and, right, watercoloring. I see. Okay, well, good luck on that one. Okay, now, poor Lindsay got in her coughing jag. What were we talking about? <laughs> you were asking me, couldn't mm -hmm. the Arab states have yeah. somehow found a way to fix, solve, support, do something to the Pal so that the situation in the Palestinian areas would be better? And I and I and I, my answer was that the four you have to separate out the four states that share contiguous borders with Israel. Those are the conflict states, right? Jordan, Egypt, Syria, and Lebanon. Jordan and, e and Egypt now have full treaties of peace with Israel. And, and for a really long time. So we're really talking about Lebanon, which is weak, and Syria, which is Syria. Right. But during, during the entire period before these treaties were reached, Egypt and Jordan, in their own way, then Syria and Lebanon, sought to control the Palestinian national movement. For two reasons. Number one, their populations were very pro-Palestinian, and that issue resonated deeply and widely in the Arab world. And number two, when the PLO was created in the late 60s, these Arab states feared, rightly, that the PLO would drag them into an unwanted war with Israel. So they wanted to control the Palestinian national movement and to use even though there was a lot of genuine sympathy for the misery and suffering of the Palestinians, they wanted to control the Palestinian national movement. So that made them very ambivalent. The Gulf states. Yes, that, those are the ones. I was, because when you're talking about poverty and misery, and yeah. you're talking about monarchs there that have crazy, crazy, crazy amounts of hundreds of billions of dollars, and if they are interested in peace, if they're interested in helping their Arab brethren, you'd think they would have done. I mean, this Jews ask this all the time in America, yeah, right? Isn't okay. this a big, I'm not being. But here's the deal, Al. Asking the original question. Right. But, and, and the Qataris and the Saudis and the Emiratis, the UAE and the Kuwaitis have all given at various times in various amounts to help ease Palestinian conditions. But the reality is you can't buy your way out of this conflict. Believe me, if we could have paid or the international community could have figured out a way to write a check that would somehow solve the problem, it would have been solved. But it's not a, it's not a financial problem. It's not even an economic problem. Well, isn't part of it, though, exacerbating conditions for folks that make them angry? Of course. If you put people in refugee camps and you deny them the right to return either to Israel proper or to the West Bank and Gaza in some putative Palestinian state, yeah, there's no question about Okay, that. that involves a right to return, and that's not funny. Yeah, I mean, funny, the, right but... the right to return is... is, is an but you see what I'm saying. There was no way the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait... These countries didn't go like, you know what? We like that there's a conflict. We don't want this to be settled. We, we want this there. We don't want to help settle this by using this uh, tremendous amount of oil money that we have and making lives easier for Palestinians and making their lives, making them less bitter at Israel because their conditions aren't, aren't as bad. I mean. I'm I'm asking, I think, a pretty 
common logical question, right? Yeah, I mean, I. Again, what, what is the answer to that? I mean, the answer uh, is that the Arab states, I, I think, yes, until the Egyptian Jordanian peace treaties were signed. And remember, those are, are you know, in a 70 year conflict, let, let's just assume. As a, as a starting point. And it's I, still like 50 years ago. Egypt was like 50 years ago or 48 years right, ago or something. Right. But until 1979, those were critically important years from 48 to 79. And remember, Egypt was at war with Israel. I understand. And regained Sinai. And the Syrians were at war with Israel and failed to gain control of Golan Heights. And the Jordanians had a huge stake in trying to maintain influence in the West Bank, because the vast majority of Jordanian population were Palestinians, not Jordanians. So, yes, I think that the Arab states played a double game here. They wanted to control the forces of Palestinian nationalism, to use it before they had agreements with Israel. And now they find themselves in a situation, particularly in the Gulf, where they're less bound by any commitment to the Palestinians. The Emiratis uh, and the Bahrainis have signed these the Abraham Accord agreements with the Israelis 2020 and have established relationships which eclipse those that have been ongoing between the Israelis and Egyptians and Israeli Israelis and Jordanians for decades. Okay, this suggests to me, this suggests to me that these countries and the Israelis have no interest to, to having a peace in Israel and Palestine. The Gulf states have less are less willing now, Al, to sacrifice. Let's put it this way. I, well, I, what I mean, are they sacrificing? What I'm are they sacrificing? They're, they're less willing to sacrifice any of their own national interests by tethering themselves to the Palestinian cause. They were prepared to do that for quite a while, even while they may not have supported the Palestinians as generously as you might have thought they should. They still were restrained and constrained. And the Emiratis and the Saudis, and, and I think Israeli-Saudi normalization seems to me to be a very distant project at this point, precisely because the Saudis cannot completely sever their themselves from the Palestinian issue, given their legitimacy uh, in the Arab world, these states ba basically made a, a calculation. And the calculation was, we were not going to let, we're not going to allow our interests to be dragged down anymore by an unresolvable, intractable, corrupt, in many respects, Palestinian national movement. And they, because of the fear of Iran, it brought them into a much closer alignment with Israel. So are you said now the Saudis, of course, made an agreement with, with Iran, brokered by the Chinese. By the Chinese, right. And, you know, the Saudi calculation is very clear. Iran has a nuclear program. It may become a nuclear weapons program. Saudis want stability. Uh, they want a good relationship with China. MBS, who is a repressive, oppressive uh, crown prince, who's one day when King Salman passes from the scene, his father is going to rule Saudi. He's only 37 years old. He's going to rule Saudi Arabia maybe for a half century. Wants to make Saudi into one of the world's 15 largest economies. He doesn't trust the U.S. anymore. He knows we are now an oil competitor with him. He doesn't like the fact Jamal Khashoggi was a friend of mine. So I'm not a neutral mm -hmm. observer in this matter. But the Chinese don't ask questions about Jamal Khashoggi. Neither, neither did Trump, particularly. Well, that's another matter. Trump saw the White House as an, as, as an ATM machine, and the Saudis basically as future business partners, which, of course, Jared Kushner has not it's two two billion two billion from yeah. them. So it's why they're in an OPEC plus with the Russians, the Saudis. Putin doesn't ask questions about human rights, and neither does President Xi. We have a Congress which correctly and understandably has questions about American-Saudi relations, pushes human rights and Saudi policies in Yemen, which they must push, and we have values. So all this is bleak. Uh, it looks like 
uh, an Israeli-Palestinian uh, agreement. It, we're as far, far away from it as we've ever been. I would say if we could be further away, farther away than we've ever been, and then add a few light years to that, yeah. That's the okay. reality. And you know, Al, here's the thing. I, I lived with working with three illusions. Illusion number one was that there was a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian problem. Illusion number two was that the only way this solution could be found was through negotiations. And illusion number three was that the U.S. could produce it. And while I still believe in all of those propositions, I've tethered them to a lot of reality, which has intruded. Well, if there are illusions, then the tethering <laughs> to reality has disillusioned well, you about I, I'd those say possibilities. I'm but look, I'm not cynical. I'm not a pessimist. I got two grown kids. I'm not going to say to them, you know, Jenny and Danny, the, the future of the Republic, of our Republic, is grave. We're going to go down one rabbit hole or the other. We're doomed. And I'm not going to say to them, there can't be a solution to the Israeli Palestinian conflict that meets the needs of both well, sides. Well, couldn't you tell them? Couldn't you tell them the Israeli-Palestinian you know, resolution is doomed, but America is in great shape? Um, wouldn't, wouldn't that I make them feel that, better? I, no, I could say to them the following. <laughs> I could I mean, say, you, you want to have a chance to solve this problem, you need three things. And you can take this to the bank. I've been preaching this since I left government. It's annoyingly negative, but it's real. Number one, you need leaders. You need leaders on both sides who are not prisoners of their ideologies or their politics. Yeah, I'm talking about Israeli-Palestinian leaders. You do not have them. All right? Okay, you don't have and leaders on both you sides. Do not okay. have them. Number two, you need a sense of ownership. Every breakthrough in this conflict was achieved initially without the presence of the United States. You need the Israelis and Palestinians to care more about this problem then in the out, you know the old phrase in the history of the world, nobody ever washed a rental car. You know that that that's that's a profound piece of philosophy, Al. Because why don't people wash rental cars? Because they care only about what they own. God, it's I feel thing. like a fucking fool. Wait, I always return the thing. Oh, come on, Al. Be straight. They vacuum it out. You you are an outlier because that's how I get it. Well, I, I mean, that's oh, your Jesus. credit. No, I'm lying. To, I'm lying to you. Of course, yes. Third, you need a mediator. <laughs> you need a you need a mediator that knows what it's doing. You don't have leadership. You don't have ownership, and you don't have a third party that's willing and able to stay with this thing. You don't have any of these things. Well, I mean, I would think that an American president like Biden. Given the other two things, would invest himself. Yes, if right? he had even one of the other two things. So, but but what you're saying is we do have one of the things: a no, mediator. What do you have? What? Which one do you have? The mediator. No, I, 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 I said I, Biden would mediate if you had the other two things, and you right, said yeah. But the other two things have to be in place. Or even one of the other two things. What you don't have even. One of the other two things. I know it's you're not, saying you can't have a mediator unless you have the other two things. What my I hear what you're saying. Call, it's what my bubby would call bupkis. That's what you've got. That's your grandmother would say you got nothing. Yeah. I'm interpreting. And, she, and she'd be right. For the Gentile, large Gentile audience tunes in. Right. Okay. So uh, we're fucked. I think, yeah, and luckily for us, this is not the greatest or gravest problem that we face in this broken, angry, and dysfunctional region. We have two issues out there now. Both start with the letter I. One is called Israel, and we're not going to be able to fix that. The other one is called Iran. And if you want an issue that could plunge the Middle East into conflict, create rising oil prices and falling financial markets, I got an issue for you. How are we or anyone going to deal with the nuclear strain or constrain Iran's already clear capacity to enrich enough uranium within a 12 to 
day to two week period to produce at least one nuclear weapon. Now, I'm not saying they've weaponized. I don't think they've made a decision to weaponize, but I got to tell you, I'm not sure. Okay, let me ask you, yeah. would this have been the case if Trump had not pulled out the answer, of the deal? E- the answer, even to those people who hated the Iran nuclear agreement, would they would probably have to say, no, it would not have been the case. We would have bought more time. Okay, more time. How we would have figured it out, eventually, you got me. But there'd be inspectors in there, right? Yeah, and you, and, the, and the Iranians would have had sanctions relief. But then again, the, the negative about the counter get that is, why would we pay these people at a time when they're murdering their own people in the streets and they're providing drones that help Vladimir Putin kill Ukrainians? So the whole thing is just politically fraught. For this administration. The, those if are good it, points. Think about it, uh, uh, Al. If Iran came to Biden tomorrow and said, okay, let's sign. Uh, we just want all our sanctions relief. I mean, it would be a tough decision for this administration. Is your wife coughing again? or is it, Lindsay, uh, are you coughing again? Doesn't matter. <laughs> you make sure you, make sure this is on the on I the, thought this uh, one might have been be on the pod, podcast now. It will be. <laughs> it will be. Lindsay. <laughs> Lindsay God, I hope Lindsay feels better. I have a cold and you, as you can hear, but I don't have a cough. Right. I and don't have that vicious a cough. How can you paint while you're coughing like that? Hope it's not like very precision portrait kind of stuff. Anyway, no, well, let's keep going, though. Let's keep going. Let's just keep going on on how uh, every every new detail you point to, it makes everything hopeless. And uh, if Iran is giving drones to uh, Russia uh, to use uh, in Ukraine, it's hard to uh, make peace with them or negotiate with them. Yes. I mean, it's a, that's, that, it's a tough one. And now the Chinese are brokering deals with the Saudis. And, you know, there's the other issue of Saudi nuclear aspiration. The Saudis don't have money and enough good relations with the Pakistanis that if they wanted a weapon, they could probably buy one. But you got to really factor in the fact that MBS, 37 years old, a.k.a. Mohammed bin Salman, guy probably, if Iran has a weapon, he's going to want one too. Yeah, if someone down the street has it, well, um, right. this is why we didn't want Iran to get it. Exactly. And Pakistan has them, right? Yeah. The Indians, the Pakistanis, the North Koreans, and the five permanent members of the Security Council. Okay. They all got nukes. So um, I, I, I really had started this uh, conversation uh, looking for some hope. And as we've progressed... It's gotten worse and worse. It, it has, but I, you know, I think what the Israelis have done in the streets. Al, and so is Lindsay's cough. Is, that is sounds... What what the Israelis have done in the streets is hopeful. I can't. I mean, you know, the Clintons both. And I remember when the day before we went to Camp David, Bill Clinton, we briefed the president, or the week before, and I remember what he said. He said, "Trying and failing is better than not having tried at all." And I remember at the time, this is 23 years ago, that I was inspired by what he had to say because it was quintessentially American now. I mean, he's right, right? If you don't try, if you don't get into the game, there's no way you can win. But I thought to myself, that's a great slogan for the University of Michigan football team, go go Wolverines. It's not a substitute for a foreign policy of the greatest nation on earth because failing costs. And we need to be much smarter about where we invest our efforts. Well, okay, give me give me a suggestion. Then let's let's finish this off uh, with your formula for getting getting all of this into a better place, or any of it, for that matter. I, I mentioned to you. I think you need two of the three things that I identified: of leadership, ownership, and effective U.S. mediation. The younger okay. generation is being weaned on despair and hopelessness. There's an organization in which Lindsay actually was involved called Seeds of Peace, which brings young Arabs and Israelis, Israelis, Palestinians, 
at one point, uh, Yemenis, Tunisians, Moroccans into conflict resolution programming in Maine. And how long has that been around? That's been around a while. It's been around since 1993. Okay. And they've produced a lot of young leaders. If you could replicate that, pro, instead of bringing 300 young leaders every summer, you could bring 3,000. But you still have to send them home, Al. You still have, they still have to go back where they're going to, you know, their parents, their grandparents, their rabbis, their imams, their priests, their politicians, their journalists. It's a conflict. And you got to stop the violence and the conflict. Then maybe you could create a transitional period that would allow success. I, I haven't, you know, Kennedy described himself as an idealist without illusion. I'm not, I'm not giving up on the fact that the world can be made a better place or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can be solved, but I'll be damned if I'm going to go through this process with my eyes closed. It's irresponsible. You have to be tethered to reality even while you dream about changing the world. The hopeful part of this to me is that there have been a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people, unprecedented number of people on the street protesting Netanyahu's move to really make this no longer a democracy, uh, and which is what Israel has been, the only democracy in the region. That's sort of the good news out of this. In terms of any kind of Israeli-Palestinian peace, peace between uh, Israel uh, and other actors in the region, although the Abraham Accords, uh, there was some movement there, but this is not been this you're, you're not in a hopeful period right now correct there we go that's what i wanted to do i wanted yes, to we're not we're not in a hopeful up. period if, if somehow somehow a way could be found certainly on the israeli side because the palestinians also have to step up even though they're clearly the weaker party i mean let's be clear they practice their own violence and armed struggle hamas and company a way could be found to get, at least on the Israeli side, because I think the Palestinians are simply so disorganized and dysfunctional in terms of, um, well, they're under, in the West Bank, they're under Israeli occupation. But to get Israelis to understand, too, that, yes, a liberal slide is a great threat to democracy, but so is the prospects of an unending Israeli occupation, because it will undermine both the political and demographic and moral character of the state of Israel. And I'm not sure that connection can be made. And I don't want to fall into the trap of putting this all on the Israelis. I mean, it, it is not one hand clapping. The Palestinians have their own dysfunction, their own missed opportunities, as have the Israelis. In the end, Al, I'm telling you, it's all about leadership. I'm not sure you can do this without men and women who are prepared to take risk. And that's rare in a conflict where Sadat and Rabin both, you know, Hate paid it. with their lives for their their peacemaking efforts. And and it's it's not going to happen for, with a Netanyahu who no, seems right. to be doing everything just not to get convicted and is, is really exactly. undermining exactly. the whole dem democracy of the only democracy in the Middle East. Right. So, uh, hence, not a hopeful time. Uh, thank you, Aaron. I, I um, hope, hope the next one is, uh, is more hopeful, although I doubt it. <laughs> I, yeah, me too. And Al, I'm sorry, by the way, for droning on on occasion, but you drop a nickel in me and all of a sudden I, I simply can't stop. So I, I, I apologize for that. No, and no, no. I want you to carry this. You know so much more about this than I do. Uh, although I have, you know, like any American, like any Jewish American, right. I have a real vested interest in this. And, um, you know, we want that region of the world to be more stable and if there were negotiations between those places and democracy somehow stay in israel and spread 
that would that would do that but that's that's not what we're we're looking at right well i i hope you enjoyed uh listening that beautiful music is by leo kotke the great leo kotke i want to thank peter ogburn for producing this podcast we'll talk again next week mm-hmm.